I'm Kathy Smith, the director of the Fox Rothschild Center for Law and Society here at Community College of Philadelphia. Today's Perspectives interview is conducted by David Trabascus, who is an adjunct faculty member here and is the pro bono counsel for the Pennsylvania Bar Association. He's also a member of the Center's advisory board. In today's interview, David speaks to William Fadulo, who is the 87th Chancellor of the Philadelphia Bar Association and is on a mission to improve funding and support of our local schools. This cause is both professional and personal for him. His wife, now a lawyer, was a, a public school teacher in this very city. Welcome to the Fox Rothschild Center for Law and Society's Perspective Series on CCP TV, the educational channel of the Community College of Philadelphia. I'm David Travaskis, adjunct professor here in the Paralegal Studies Program at the college. Today it is my pleasure to introduce our distinguished guest, Bill Fadula, the 87th Chancellor of the Philadelphia Bar Association. Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here. The first question, obviously, our audience will ask is, what's a Chancellor of the Bar Association? Well, it's sort of like the president of the Bar Association. It's just a, a name that uh, we've traditionally had for our, our leader as, as a Bar Association. And what a chancellor does is uh, basically set policy for the, third, for the Bar Association itself and its 13,000 members. And, and you get to serve one year term, your vice chancellor, and then your chancellor elect, and then your chancellor. And the year you serve is <coughs> calendar year, right? January yes, to yes. December. Yes, it is. Now, uh, odd thing, I know the Philadelphia Bar is the oldest Bar Association mm -hmm. in the country. It's well over 200 years. That's correct. How come there's only been 87 chancellors if you only serve a year? Well, we're, we're uh, 1802 was the beginning of the Philadelphia Bar Association, and the initial chancellors, William Rawl was the very first, who, uh, who was the founder of Rawl and Henderson, served lifetime. Uh, and the first three chancellors, I think, totaled about 40 years of service because uh, when you had this job initially, you had it till you died. And uh, the two year, it, the one-year terms didn't really start until the 1950s. In, until uh, in the early 1900s through 1950, it was basically a two-year term. But since about 1950, everybody served a one-year term. That's why I'm only the 87th rather than the 212th <laughs> chancellor. <laughs> now, um, you're a lawyer, and obviously you have a practice of your own. What kind of work do you do? I do. Uh, uh, plaintiff personal injury cases, hopefully high-end quality, uh, you know, very catastrophic injuries, whether from product problems or, or, or accidents or sometimes malpractice. And we also do a little, a little bit of business work in our firm. And, uh, you know, so it's very, it's very enjoyable, the work I do, because it's not the same case over and over again. Uh, you, every case is a little bit different. So it, it requires you to, to learn different areas of, of both medicine and law. So I've always enjoyed that aspect of, of our practice. And did you <coughs> become a lawyer here in Philadelphia, or did you come to Philadelphia from somewhere else? No, I'm a lifelong Philadelphian. Uh, I was born here in uh, 1949. My father owned a bar at Bowdoin Tasker. I lived above the bar. I was a baby at Methodist Hospital when I was a child. Uh, that's where I, I was born. We lived here until I was about six or seven years old, and my father sold that bar and, and built another bar in Brigantine, New Jersey. And we lived there until I was 13, and we moved back here. And we always came back a lot, because my mom was a city girl. She just loved the city. So uh, we would always visit Philadelphia during the weekends, and we moved back here when I was 13, kept keeping a house in Brigantine. But uh, essentially, I've been in Philadelphia my whole life. And you're a Temple grad? Yes, I am. I, I was an undergrad at Temple and, and, uh, and law school at Widener. I met my wife at uh, Temple my junior year. Um, there's a story attached to that, and which she tells in The Bar Reporter, and, and I won't repeat it here, but uh, we met at Temple. And we're married, and we have uh, a 20-year-old who's a sophomore at Swarthmore, Billy, and, uh, or Bill. I should call him Bill because he insists on that now. And he wants to be a lawyer also, because I guess he can't help it, sort of in his genes. His, his mom, my wife's a lawyer also. She's a partner at Wilson Elser. And uh, I, I guess he just, he just can't help that desire to be a lawyer. 
So well, it's nice yeah. to keep it in the family <laughs> and have those things come yeah. through. Now, you said as chancellor, you developed the policy for the bar association. Yeah, you, you get to be basically determine what your goals are for a particular year. I mean, keeping in mind some some of the things in the bar association are ongoing. Uh, and, and that other chancellors have, have started or the Bar Association it, it itself has started. And there's other initiatives that you can start yourself. So w we have a sort of a combination of that this year. And uh, I think probably the initiative that's gotten the most attention that we've started is our school initiative, this, the task force that I put together for the schools because um, what we saw was this was, this year is the 60th anniversary of Brown v. Board of Education. And as I was contemplating that and contemplating I wanted to do something regarding Brown v. Board of Education for this year, I also thought about the implications of Brown v. Board of Education and whether we've lived up to what that case meant. And I mean, the easy answer is seeing what the funding issues in Philadelphia and throughout the Commonwealth are is, is that we're not. And that we needed to make sure that the schools were adequately funded equally funded, and also there'd be a dedicated source of funding. So in December, when I made my, my initial speech, I talked about that. I talked about law schools, uh, law firms sponsoring schools. And we've tried to put that together with some success to this point. We're hoping that by the end of my year, that at least 100 law firms have signed on to sponsor schools, and that my, my successors, Al Dandrews and Gate and Alfano, will continue this program until we have, you know, 100% law firm participation and lawyer participation in this because it's such a compelling issue. You know, if we're not educating our kids and we're not making sure that Philadelphia lives up to the ideal of being a world-class city, we're really nowhere. And as, if we're not going to do it as lawyers, I don't know who else is going to do it. And, and the gratifying thing is that uh, it's, there's been such a wonderful response both from the school district, from the teachers and principals, and from the lawyers and law firms. And, and uh, I'm hoping that this is an ongoing thing. We're asking the firms to make a three-year commitment at, at minimum. And our hope is that um, when this is done, that the um, funding issue will, will have been resolved in some fashion because I really hope that politicians of every stripe understand the need to fund schools, to fund them fairly and equitably and to find a dedicated source of funding. Now, it's your own family has some experience <coughs> in the Philadelphia schools. Yes, they do. Your wife was a teacher? My wife taught for eight years at William Penn High School, and she loved it, and the kids loved her. She was a terrific teacher. Uh, I substituted, substitute taught for three years when I was in law school. Um, my wife eventually became a lawyer because I guess she thought I could do it. If I could do it, so, so <laughs> could she. And uh, so we have, you know, a real love for the kids and, and a real need, I think, to give back. And the un and understanding that um, you know you have to lead by example a little bit. My firm has adopted a school, Dobson School in Maniunk. And, and can you tell us about that Dobson School? Yeah, it's a great, great school. I met with uh, it's a grammar school. It's pre-K through eighth grade. I met through Karen Buck, uh, who was the head of the senior law project, uh, the principal at Dobson, which is Patty Cruz. But, and we had we had a breakfast at Marathon and. We talked and I, I told her about my plans and she told me of their need at the school and what her school was and, and how she just loved the kids and loved the, but I asked her how about the things that you're doing without. And she gave us a number as to the amount of money they could use to, to have things that the kids were doing without. And my firm's a small firm, there's only, there's only five of us. And I said, uh, my firm could do that. You know, we could, we could supply that money. So what we're doing is we're, we're working with the school district to uh, have a protocol as to how to do this, how, how to f fund the money to also mentor and counsel the kids and be involved in, in their lives. And, and, it's, and it's so gratifying. The, we had the quarterly luncheon where we had four of the children there. We had Jaden and we had Maurice and, and we had Sydney and we had Seth Williams, the namesake of our DA. And Patty and, the, and also the head of the, of the Parent Teachers Association came, came to our luncheon and they just won the crowd over. I mean, there, there were some great speeches that, that day. Dr. Height made a great speech. Dean Epps made a great speech. But I think the kids were the star of the show. And that Friday, um, I, I, along with Karen and a few other people, went to Dobson School. It was my first time there. And the reception there was, was so gratifying. You know, it was like one of the one of the best days you can imagine, and um, they sang some songs for us, and they did a dance routine for us. They sang a song from the '60s because I'm a child of the '60s, 
And uh, then we had a judge, they, they decorated doors in anticipation of the, of the testing that's upcoming. And it was hard to judge third graders against sixth graders and seventh graders and eighth graders, but I think we came up with an equitable solution to that. And uh, there was winners, everybody was a winner that participated. And uh, you know, it's something that we hope, I know, is going to be ongoing in my life. And I hope that every, every lawyer that has the opportunity and the funds to do that will do this, will do something like this. Well, you have said that you got the idea <coughs> to do this because you were reflecting on the Brown decision. Yep. Um, and can you go into detail about what you see when you think about Brown and you look at the Philadelphia Public Schools? Well, you know, Brown s allegedly stopped uh, discrimination in, in, s in schools on the basis of race. Uh, and what we're seeing now, I think, is we're seeing discrimination on, on, on the basis of zip code. You know, if you're in a, in a richer school district, your, your school gets more money because of the tax structure. And that, in a way, does also become discrimination on the basis of, of race. Um, and it's just, it's just unfair. The kids that need the most have the least. A and that is not the way the American dream is supposed to be. The, w the way out for the American dream is education. You get yourself a good education and you fulfill your potential. Now we're saying we're not even going to give you, you know, the basic means to have a good education, but yet we're going to expect you to fulfill what you're supposed to be as a, as a citizen. It can't work that way. It can't work unless we fully fund the, the schools in a way that's meaningful, that we have a dedicated source of funding, which means to know where the funds are going to come from each year. We can't have a situation where the schools don't even know whether they're going to open. You know? And I think Dr. Height, having met him a few times and spoken with him, is a great, great leader. I think that we're, we're very foolish if we don't ha have take the opportunity to benefit from his leadership on these issues. And I think he's a person that really can get the job done. He's, he's personally assured me he will stay. He, <laughs> he's not going anywhere. So we want to give him the, the ability, because he has the ability already, but we want to give him the means to do the job that he intends to do. He wants to have 100% of the high school graduates, uh, of the kids in school, be, become high school graduates. And some people say, well, that's impossible. And I say, uh, uh, bravo for him. I think that's terrific that he has that goal. I, I, I think he's the kind of person that can actually fulfill that goal. Uh, if you look at his track record, he's done amazing things elsewhere. And we, sh we should, as citizens of Philadelphia, be happy we have him and give him the resources he needs. Now, you said that Dob Dobson School, that you guys have adopted your firm, mm -hmm. was in need of certain things. Were you surprised by any of the things they were in need of? Well, I wasn't surprised uh, particularly because they, they may have less needs than some other schools. Because mm -hmm. uh, some of the, if you as I was preparing for the December speech, I was reading ads in, in the Inquirer and in the Daily News talking about things the school district needed. And among the things that the school district needed were paper and tissues and number two pencils. You know, and I was kidding Patty because when we were rating the kids for their doors, she gave me a number two pencil. And I said, well, you, you guys at least have number two pencils. Um, but the, the need is great. I mean, there, there is nothing that the schools need more than, than, the, than basic love and affection, but they also need the support and things like number two pencils and things like papers and things like computers and also the active services of, of nurses and counselors. You know, you, we see the stories of there's one nurse per every 1,500 students. That's, that's really, and, and the nurse has to go to three or four or five different schools in a particular day. That's not the way it should be. Counselors, we look at Masterman School, apparently they didn't have enough counselors to get all, all the applications out to college for kids that were, were buried by kids and were going to be able to maybe get scholarships. You just didn't have enough counselors to get, get the applications out. So there's basic things that we're denying these kids. You know, and One of the points I made in December was that as lawyers, we've all had a good education. You know, mm -hmm. We already all had a good enough education to become lawyers. Let's give these kids the same opportunity we had. You know, let's let them fulfill. Maybe not everyone will be a lawyer, but let's let them fulfill the potential that they can fulfill, and let's give them a good education. It's going to benefit not just them, it's going to benefit the city in the long run. And we have to start paying a whole lot more attention to education in this, not just in this city, in this Commonwealth, but in this country. I think we're 16th in the world in education, and for the richest nation in the world to be 16th is appalling and uh, we should be number one or two or three. If you're really a patriot, 
you would you would think that you want uh, the education system in this country to be the best there is in the world. Now, people listening to us may be saying, you know, I'm sh hope they're saying they're delighted that a lawyer would be so concerned about the schools. But even if you can get every firm in the city to adopt a school, the numbers that they're talking about that the Philadelphia School District is in deficit are yeah. hundreds of millions of dollars of deficits. No, you're, you're right. I mean, the government has to do it. It can't just, we're, we're a stopgap, really. The law firms are a stopgap. We're, we want to be helpful. We will, and I'm sure not just lawyers, but businesses are also joining this effort. And we want to be helpful, and we will be. But eventually, and essentially, government has to provide the funding. It's, it's part of our constitution in Pennsylvania that the government has to do this. And we're looking to that every elected official joins us in this and says that we have to fund the schools. We have to fund, and we have to have a dedicated source of funding because essentially it's a government challenge, and a government has to affect the change. And uh, so I'm looking for politicians, and, and I have been approached by politicians of all stripes, Democrats and Republicans, who have said that's the right issue, it's the thing we need to do, we're d if we're, we're not doing this, we're, we're hurting our future, and we intend to help. So I hope they do. I hope that all the politics, I hope every candidate for governor signs on to a resolution saying they'll fully fund the schools in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, and that they'll find a dedicated source of funding. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping that that happens. And, and if they do, I hope they follow through on their promise. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the ongoing programs of the chancellor is a push for access to justice. Yes. And it's funny, as you were talking about education, I can see the connections between this mm -hmm. past push, which is continuing on access to justice, and the need for right. full educational funding. Right. But um, can you tell us where this Access to Justice initiative stands? Because when we look out at the courts, there's still most of the people going into the courts, especially our family court, are going in pro se, unrepresented. Yep. Yep. Well, we've, many chancellors ago, <laughs> uh, I think starting with Sadie Ledov, uh, this, this push actually started. It was called Civil Gideon, and it's become Access to Justice. It's still sometimes referred to as Civil Gideon. And we're to the point now, I think, through the help of people like you and, and several of the chancellors, including all of my immediate predecessors, and also especially with the help of, of, of Chief Justice Castile, we're to the point, hopefully, where the courts are, are almost to the point where they're going to adopt this as, as an initiative and fund it so that uh, people who need a lawyer, for instance, if they're about to lose their house, if you put a, if you put a family out in the street because they lost their house, you've, you've changed the dynamic a lot. You've, caused, you've actually cost yourself money by putting them out on the street. If you get a lawyer to represent them and keep them in the house, that family is going to stay intact. They're going to have the ability to send their kids to school. You know, they're going to have a more stable home life for their family and a, and a place that they can work from. Um, so in crucial areas like that, where somebody's about to lose their home and, and need a lawyer, we want to be able to provide a lawyer for them. And that's what civil access is all about, civil Gideon, if you will. And it's our hope that before the end of the year, and I think it's Chief Justice Castile's wish too, that this is funded by the court, by however we're going to fund it. I don't know what the court's going to fund it entirely or not, but that this is funded, it's, it's up and running and ready to go. And that not just in Philadelphia, obviously, but throughout, because you've been a, a great resource in, in helping throughout the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania f with the other bar associations, especially in, in the Pennsylvania bar also, that this, this is a process that uh, comes to fruition and that uh, Justice Saylor, when he becomes Chief Justice, and the other justices will participate and support this. And, and we, we, th we think they will, and we think also Senator Greenleaf has been just a wonderful resource for us. He's been very supportive of this issue, and we're really proud of him and, and what he's done for this issue. Mm -hmm. And the Philadelphia Bar has really shown a great leadership on this, taking the, its Civil Gideon um, Committee has really been the g genesis of the statewide push. Do you think you'll have that same kind of statewide effort with your education initiative? Well, I'm hoping we do. Uh, I've talked to leadership in the Delaware County Bars, and the Montgomery County Bars. Other bar associations have, have approached me and saying, we really like what you're doing. We, we will support you in every way we can. I mean, part of the problem we've had so far this year is we had so many snow days. I, <laughs> I feel like I've missed a month of work because of snow days. Although I have to say, I did go to work every one of the snow days. But we, we really feel like, uh, you know, you only have one year as chancellor to right. get things done. And it, it's approaching April, and, and I feel like my time's running out already. Uh, so I really want to get all the bars in, in Pennsylvania on this. Because if, if we do, I mean, the power, the power of all the lawyers in Pennsylvania supporting this issue would, would be enormous. And it would mean also that we're going to get this done. Because we, we have 
you know, we have uh, such a powerful tax base, for one thing, that if we're saying we want our taxes to be, to be spent on educating the kids and, and helping them, you know, that's going to have an enormous impact. So I'm hoping not just Montgomery County and Delaware County, along with Philadelphia, participate, but every other county in, in Pennsylvania does also. And um, if they do, I think we'll be successful. Now, I think people would be surprised to know the number of initiatives that touch the school that come out of the Bar Association. Some are mm -hmm. very obvious. We have the annual mock trial competitions. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Philadelphia has actually been a champion statewide in that right. numerous times. Uh, Masterman, you mentioned right. earlier, and Overbrook has won three mm -hmm. times. Uh, we have an ACE program. Yes. The ACE program, uh, John, Judge John Young, who's actually the co-chair of, of our school task force, was the head of this program, and this year I think it's uh, Judge Janice Brinkley is the head of the ACE program this year, and, it, and it's a program in which different judges and lawyers go to schools, and they t talk to them about being a judge or being a lawyer, and they tell they tell the kids, you know, what what's necessary, you know, what kind of schooling you're going to have to go through, what you can do, what kind of careers you can have in law, including pro bono careers, and you know, it's been a very successful program far long before I became chancellor. Uh, you have the LEAP program up at Temple. With You participated in it with Roberta West. It's just a terrific program. I participated in that about a week ago in which there was a competition. I think there was the finals about a week ago between two schools who we did not know about until the very end who, who they were. And uh, it, was, it was wonderful to see the level of competition for these high school kids who were quite professional in their arguments. They were really super. Any one of them I would have suspected it was like a junior or, or a, a sophomore junior in law school, you know, and uh, ready, ready to go out and practice law. But they were just superb, and that's another great program that's, that's run on a, on a yearly basis. And there's other programs, too, like Philadelphia Futures, which run, my wife participated in, Phil Philadelphia Reads. Uh, there's a bunch. I've, I've met with different pe people, like Dolores Brisbon, who... Uh, is involved in a campaign to help black youths, black, black kids, who uh, males especially, because Laura says she works better with males than females, <laughs> and to, to get these kids an, another way, to get them a, on a path that's going to get them an education. A and, and people like Dolores, who, who, uh, who are just doing yeoman work out there, and are do, like I call them secular saints. They, they really do work to just inspire you every day. And uh, so I, I think with all this energy together, my thought is we put together an education summit in the next couple of months and get all the, all the participants, all the people who want to participate together. And maybe we'll even do it here at Community College. And uh, I just talked to Jill, and I'm hoping that maybe we have a big enough room here to do that so that we can put all, all the players together. And sometimes we duplicate work, too, by the way. So if we, if we can find a way not to duplicate the work but to get the energy in that room into the schools and into the kids, I, I think it'll be just a terrific outcome. Well, and I think that's actually what is unique about your initiative as chancellor, is there have been many, many outreaches to schools, but there hasn't been one that really targeted the overall school structure mm -hmm. and really went to the fundamental issue of if we aren't supplying resources to the schools sufficient for them to do a proper education, then all the extras that we can bring as lawyers, as members of the communities, can't make a difference. It's, it's not just a bleak picture of non-funding. You know, there is some really positive things going on. I don't want to mislead people and think nothing is helping. Every, there, there, there is a, a dynamic going on that is really working. But we need to, to make, we can't just stop here. You know, we have to get to the 100% level that Dr. Hyde talks about. We can't stay at the 70 or 80% level. We've got to get to the 100% level. And, and the way I've had it explained to me is, and I've seen this myself, where you see a teacher with 35 kids in a classroom mm -hmm. doing a magnificent job, right. and you wonder what m magic that teacher could do right. if that teacher only had 20 kids or yeah. 25 kids. Toughest job I ever had was being a teacher. Much tougher than being a trial lawyer. Being a trial lawyer is a snap compared to being a teacher. Of course, you have to, with the, with the trial, at best you have 12, 12 lawyers and a couple alternates that you have to convince. In school every day, you have 30, 35, 40 kids that you have to convince to listen to you. So, I mean, I, my, my praise goes out to all the teachers. Many, many of them are just super people. They reach into their own pocket to, to donate things to the, to the kids that they teach. They, they do lesson plans over the weekend. It's a very, very tough job. So I'm not one of those who want to be critical of teachers. I, I'm not, not going to go there at all. Uh, I, I think it's, it's as tough a job as you can have because not only to, is it tough on you, but you have to reach all these children. You know, you have to, and, and some of them are coming to school from a dysfunctional house, 
You know, and some of them just need a little bit of love, and some of them need a lot of love, and, and, and they all need to be fed, and they all need to be taught. So it's a very, very tough job, and it's a job that um, for only special people can really do well. And uh, so I, I think that uh, we, should, we should praise our teachers and help them. I, I, I see the sacrifice made by, recently by the principals who've all taken a, a $20,000 $20, cut in salary. How, how many professions would do that? You know, ask yourself, you know, how many, <laughs> how many lawyers out there would s voluntarily take a $20,000 cut in salary? There's not that many that would do that. So the people involved in education are, are doing some great things, and, and they, they're entitled to the praise, and they're also educating the kids, but we have to do better. And what is exciting is that with your leadership, the Philadelphia Bar Association seems to be really on the side of schools. And as you said, and I think it's important to stress to our audience, this is not just Bill Fadula's single year, no. but this is a commitment. You're asking law firms to make a three-year commitment, right. and you have the commitment of the next two chancellors who yes. follow you. Yeah, Al, Al's a product of the Philadelphia school system. Al's a marvelous guy, and he's going to be a great chancellor. And, and it's what we've done, what we've done with Al. We went to see Dr. Height the first time. Al came along and expressed his viewpoint. And I rely a lot on, on what Al has yeah, to Al say. Al Dandridge is Al going Dandridge. to be the 88th chancellor. Right, exactly. And, and Gayton will follow at, Al, and, and Gayton's made the same commitment. So I think that the school district initiative is in good hands after, after me. And I think that anybody comes after Al and Gayton is going to see the benefit of, of doing this. Uh, it's, it's, it's helping your city. You know, it's, it's the right thing to do. It's the moral thing to do. It's a smart business thing to do. It's right in so many ways that th there's no reason not to do it. And uh, so I'm confident that the following leadership after me will, will continue to do it. And I'm excited, and I think our audience is excited that they'll be able to see things that the Philadelphia Bar, that lawyers in Philadelphia are doing. Is there anything our audience can do to help your effort? Well, they can go onto the website, philadelphiabar.org, and on that website is the Sponsor School Initiative. And they could contact us through that if they're interested, if they're a law firm, a lawyer interested, or a business, for, for instance, is in, interested. We've gotten some of the realtors involved. Alan Dom came to our last lunch, and he's very interested in helping. Ernst & Young, the accountant firm, is interested in helping. There's a lot of businesses around that want to help us and, wanna, more importantly, want to help the schools. So if you go to philadelphiabar.org, you'll be able to, to participate in this exciting project. And it, it, believe me, it'll make you feel good. It really will. It sounds it. And from yeah. you talking about visiting Dobson, we can, we can see that. Well, I do want to thank you, Bill, for being here. That's all the time we have. So I want to thank my guest, Bill Fedula, the 87th Chancellor of the Philadelphia Bar Association, for joining us. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in. You've been watching the Fox Rothschild Center for Law and Society Perspective Series on CCP-TV, the educational channel of the Community College of Philadelphia. I'm David Travaskis, adjunct professor in the Paralegal Studies Program. For more information, please contact us at the Community College, and we will see you next time on CCP-TV.